let's jump right into the jargon of the day. This is our sort of warm up on Wednesdays and Mondays. We uh, take one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out what in the hey nani nani are those experts talking about. And first we give you the actual definition. When it's appropriate, we make fun of it with its additional jargon. Then we move on to our working definition to try to crack this thing open and, and have us have an understanding of what it is that we're talking about. Because we know that jargon, while it really can slow you down if you don't know what it is, if you do know what it is, it can speed things up for you. So that's why we take these things on. So today's term is hyposensitivity. Now, if you were watching on Monday, we did hypersensitivity, and I promised that we would do the opposite ends of the end of the spectrum. So let's take a look at what our actual definition is. I'm going to guess that there's not much to be made fun of here, but uh, let's take a look. Hyposensitivity is an, a marked absence of reaction to everyday stimuli. Okay. It's, I don't think there's anything to be made fun of there. It's not full of extra jargon except stimuli. Um, but I don't know that it gets us really close to understanding what it is we're talking about. So let's go ahead and look at our working definition here. So hy hyposensitivity is under act, under reacting to sensory inputs such as pain, loud noises, et cetera. So when we talked on Monday about hypersensitivity, it's somebody who's really reactive. So, you know, if, if somebody, you know, those air horns, those, oh, those horrible air horns, and you're at a sporting event and you're sitting next to someone and they blow the air horn. And, you know, we, we would say that the typical reaction is that, you know, everybody's going to jump a little bit, right? But for some people, that that jump and that noise could be so debilitating if you were hypersensitive that you could be doubled over in pain and not able to get back to the game even within an hour. That would be hypersensitivity. On the other end of it, someone who's hyposensitive could be the person who sits there and is blowing it, blowing it, blowing it and having no reaction because to them... It's not, there's, there, you know, it's not any louder in their nervous system than me talking right now. And so what's interesting is that you can be hypersensitive to some stimuli and hyposensitive to others. And I think a lot of times we forget that, that each and every one of us has this system and it's very, it's like, you know, dials in, in a mixing board and we sort of level out at different places for different things. And if you think about it, 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 it becomes who we are and what kinds of things that we like to listen to. Because if you love like a really, you know, big bass drum and a bass guitar, then you're going to listen to your music in a certain way. And you're going to go to different kinds of concerts and you're going to find yourself drawn to different kinds of events. Right. But if you're somebody that that for me, um, like when a car goes by and it has that bass thing, it gives me uh, I have a heart arrhythmia and it sets it off and it makes my heart beat kind of funny. So, you know, I have a hyper sensitivity to that and I don't want to be around things that are really loud and bass. I avoid those things. Right. Um, but think about with hyposensitive hyposensitivity. What are the kinds of problems that we run into. If someone is hyposensitive to pain, then, you know, you could think of that and think, oh, well, that's a really good thing, except is it? Because what happens is they keep doing something even though they're hurting themselves. And we see this a lot with people that, um, you know, they'll, they'll get a bruise and you ask them, how did, how did you get that? And they're like, I don't, I don't really know because they're not, they weren't sensitive enough to feel the pain that was happening and they kept doing a repetitive motion. So I think the biggest problem though, is making assumptions that sometimes people make the assumption that individuals who are on the spectrum are one or the other, and you can so easily be wrong. And if the person isn't able to communicate what they're feeling, then we are guessing. And that is a dangerous place to be in, right? There are telltale signs that will help us to know if someone is hyper or hypo sensitive. Um, you know, when we see a loud noise and we see kids cover their ears and double over, I think that's a reasonable thing to say they're uncomfortable and in pain when they're hearing that noise. 
Um, I think we don't catch the hypo sensitivity as often as we catch the hyper with young kids on the spectrum. Um, but a lot of times when someone sees a hypo sensitivity, it brings up a feeling of fear. And, and I just want to say, if we can get to the point where we look at all all behavior is communication. And if we start looking at it that way and looking at it fearlessly, then we can be a better support to people. It took me years. I, I think my son was probably 13 years old before I knew that, because he could tell me that an egg carton that's the styrofoam egg carton drives him completely crazy. Um, that that is a noise that he just, he likes styrofoam. He can't, he can't handle it. Uh, and, and I wish I'd known it sooner, um, uh, because I, I, you know, just switched to buying eggs that are either in a plastic container or in the paper, the recycled paper ones that we like better. Um, didn't know, didn't know, you know? So I think being really, really sensitive ourselves and watching for that communication from individuals. And, and then when they have the ability to communicate, asking, Right. But a lot of people, we, you know, whether they're very young kids and don't have the language yet, or they might be teenagers or adults that don't have that level of functional communication, uh, we always want to be working for that. Um, but, you know, the truth is, is some, some people don't have the facility to be able to do that. We have to be sensitive. Kirk says, my parents could tell I had a headache coming on before I could. So I guess that would be hyposensitive. Uh, well, you know, I mean, interesting, but, uh, it sounds like your parents started keying into behaviors that they saw were the antecedent to the headache, which is those, that's some good parents. I wonder if now Kirk, if now in your life at this point, do you now recognize the, the symptoms of when you have a headache coming on? Cause if you think about it, it's very similar to having to go to the bathroom. You know, there comes a point where what we actually do is teach individuals, these are the signals that come when you have to go to the bathroom. That's really the heart of everything with potty training, right? Is recognizing, oh, when your body does this, this may see, seem unrelated to that moment at the toilet, but they aren't, right? And having that awareness of this happens first and then this happens. And we're all like that, right? I know adults that I get sick on planes. Like I get car sick no matter what. And I have friends that uh, just don't understand that they also do. <laughs> I have a friend who loves to fly, loves to fly. She gets sick every single time. She never associates it with flying because she loves flying and she doesn't want to associate those things. She doesn't want to be like me. Who's like, Oh, I don't want to fly. Cause I get sick. Um, right. So she doesn't put it together. I've flown with her so much. And I'm like, you get sick every time we fly, you get sick to your stomach, you get nauseous. It's the same thing that I get. And she's like, no, I, I fly really well. No, <laughs> you know, uh, she does not want to connect those things. And often if you think about it, there are things that we eat that we don't want to associate that, oh, I get a tummy ache after I eat ice cream. I don't want to have that, right? So, um, but we can learn an association, cause and effect kinds of things. Um, so I'm interested, Kirk, do you now recognize before you get a headache what the telltale signs are that your parents were seeing? Um, write in and let me know if you can. Thanks for watching Autism Live. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.